Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast. Our topic, Mastering Power Integrity, sponsored by Keysight Technologies, formerly Agilent Electronics Measurement Group. I'm Bill Wong, editor with Electronic Design. Let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First of all, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply hit F5 to refresh your webcast console. If you need assistance solving common issues, please click on the yellow help icon below the slides. To maximize the slide presentation window, press the small green button on the top right corner of the slide window. We welcome your questions during today's event. Just type your question into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Electronic Design website within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. You may also download a PDF copy of the slides by clicking on the green folder icon in the toolbar beneath the slides. Now, let me introduce today's speakers. Steve Sandler is the founder and former CEO of AEI Systems, a company specializing in design, troubleshooting, and worst case analysis of high reliability satellite and power electronic systems. He is also the CEO of Ecotest.com, a company that designs and distributes test accessories related to power system measurement. He is the author of several power-related books, including his most recent work, Power Integrity Measuring, Optimizing, and Troubleshooting Power Systems. He is a frequent contributor to EDN and the recipient of the 2015 Jim Williams Contributor of the Year ACE Award. He has produced several recent video articles and presentations on, on target impedance and roadways. He is also a Keysight certified expert. Heidi Barnes is a senior application engineer for high-speed digital applications at Keysight ESOF EDA. Her recent activities include the application of electromagnetic transient and channel simulators to solve the challenges of high-speed CERTES and parallel bus communication links. Past experience includes six years in signal integrity for ATE test fixtures or Verigy, an advanced group, six years in RF microwaves, microcircuit packaging for Agilent Technologies, and 10 years with NASA in the aerospace industry. Heidi graduated from the California Institute of Technology in 1986 with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. She has been with Keysight EDA since 2012. Now, let me turn things over to our presenters. Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm very excited to be here today to talk about power integrity. And uh, there are many takeaways today, but I think before we can talk about power integrity, we need to kind of understand what it is, so we at least need a definition. And so in broad terms, I'd like to say that the uh, term power integrity really means that we're concerned about making sure that all of our circuits and devices get appropriate power. And so a lot of us are familiar with how this works in high-speed systems and that we need to keep voltages uh, within the allowable limits. But power integrity is really about a lot more than that. And I think that's hopefully what we're going to show you today is the interactions between uh, power circuits and, and circuit planes and system loads and how it is that they generate noise and how it is that we can best minimize that. I really like this slide. Um, you know, a lot of our high-speed and data stream circuitry is dependent on low noise, uh, low jitter clocks. And so I found this uh, schematic that shows an ultra-low phase noise crystal oscillator. And it doesn't have many parts to it. Interestingly, just a bit of trivia, but the atomic clock oscillator on the GPS satellite happens to look very similar to this oscillator. And this, of course, is shown without the power supply. If we look at that same oscillator with the power supply, one of the things that you probably noticed is there's an awful lot more power supply than there is clock. And so I think that this really makes a good statement about 
how it is that power relates to our system level performance. In a similar way, I think that I read a statistic just recently that said the typical smartphone today has between 50 and 80 percent of its circuitry dedicated to power systems. And so that's really what we're going to explore today. What is power integrity? A lot of us are familiar with signal integrity, so I, I wanted to compare signal integrity to power integrity. They're very tightly related, but they're also independent things. Now, signal integrity became popular about 20 years ago. Yes, I know people were doing signal integrity uh, probably more like 40 years ago, but it really got popular more like 20. Power integrity is really just coming into its own, and it just really started getting popular maybe five years ago. They have things in common, and they have things that are significantly different. Signal integrity is based on transmission lines, and power integrity, for the most part, is concerned with transmission planes. Uh, in signal integrity, we typically have impedance levels that we want to match, 50 ohms, 100 ohms. Power integrity is typically in milliohms, but we generally don't have good defined impedances to match. In signal integrity, we're looking at signal quality and eye diagrams, and in power integrity, we're really looking more about DC drops, decoupling, and just true uh, noise impacts. On the signal integrity side, we're looking at IBIS models, and we tend to be SPICE-oriented. And on the power integrity side, we tend to be more uh, system-level oriented, so ADS, and we're looking at decoupling capacitors and parasitics. And uh, on the signal integrity side, we're looking at trace widths and lengths and vias. On the power integrity side, we're looking at some of those things also, but we also have to make sure that we have sufficient amounts of copper to carry high levels of current. So what's noise? If we're going to talk about noise, I think we need to have a definition of that also. And I think that my general definition of noise is simply everything that we don't want to see. Um, I looked this up in a dictionary recently, and they had a pretty nice definition. It said that noise is something that tends to obscure signals that we're hoping to see. And that's probably a good definition. But I think a broader term is anything that we don't want will categorize as noise. So let's look at a simple distribution network. A power distribution network generally receives input power, and it ultimately uh, provides power to a system load. In between the two, there's lots of circuitry. There's typically an EMI filter. The EMI filter is connected to a voltage regulator module, or VRM. The VRM connects through planes and cables towards our load. Uh, we have decoupling capacitors that are distributed among the board to control noise before our power actually gets to the load. In the end, I think that the important thing that we all need to realize is that this is really all about the load. This isn't really about generating nice power at the voltage regulator module. It's about getting appropriate power to the load. So once we actually get to the load, we still got a little bit further to go. We're going to go into the package through pins. We have bond wires. We ultimately get to the wafer die. And on the wafer die, we're ultimately getting power directly to the transistors that need it. So when we talk about getting appropriate power to our loads, what we really mean is that we have to get nice, clean power uh, consistent with what it is that our device needs to see at these transistors that are on the die. That's our end goal. So what are the noise paths? If, if our goal is to try to figure out how to minimize noise, we need to understand the noise paths. So we're going to break this up a little bit finer. We have input that comes from somewhere. Uh, we connect that through cables, impedances, and connectors to the input of our system level box where we see input filters. Then the input filter connects through planes and traces, ultimately gets to the voltage regulator module. Then we connect through more plates and traces through impedances and connectors, and finally gets to our devices, whether it's low noise amplifiers, VCOs, ADCs, FPGAs, whatever it is that our load device actually is. That's where we're trying to get the clean power. So if we want to look at what noise means, well, it means that at the battery side or the input source, there's going to be noise. 
And some of that noise is going to flow through our power distribution network, ultimately making its way to the load. Uh, one example is in an automotive application, we turn the key to accessory and the FPGs, FPGAs and electronics all light up and everything's running and the battery is nice and clean. But then we turn the key to start and all of a sudden the starter motor starts turning and we end up with these crazy transients that might uh, drag our bus around from as low as 6 volts to maybe as high as 50 volts. And some of that noise that's sitting on that battery is going to ultimately get to our load circuits. Our job is to minimize it. But that's one source of noise. There's filter-related noise. This was popularized by uh, Dr. Middlebrook in the 1970s, and he talked about the relationship between the impedance of EMI filters and the the impedance of voltage regulators and how they interact. So that's another source of noise. The voltage regulator module itself also has noise. There's internal ripple and spike noise and voltage reference noise, and some of that comes out through the voltage regulator and ultimately makes its way to our system. Then we have load-induced noise. That's the one that most of you are probably familiar with. We take our high-speed networks and we have uh, simultaneous switching noise that generates relatively large currents in our FPGAs, and that generates noise voltages at our loads and also distributes in other places in the system. Uh, one that's not so common that I'd just like to highlight is the fact that uh, when we first turn on the system, it is possible for our voltage regulators to have overshoot, and that is considered a noise signal, and it's important for us to understand that one because that does contribute to our noise window and noise margins. I want to break this up even finer because now we want to talk about how it is that we're going to manage noise and how it is that we can minimize it. And so I've broken this uh, distribution system now up to three pieces. So the first piece is a passive network that includes the input source, interconnects, cables, planes, and generally the input filter. And I gave it port numbers just to make it easy for us to refer to the interfaces. Once we get through the input filter, we ultimately connect to the VRM, and so that's also another two ports. We have an input to the VRM and we have an output to the VRM that has its own internal noise. And I also highlighted the internal voltage reference because the voltage reference inside the VRM, even though it's often not accessible, is one of the major sources of noise. So I wanted to identify it here. Then we have a third box, and that's another passive network, and that's where we take the output of the VRM and we run it across planes and traces into decoupling capacitors where it ultimately connects to the load. That's typically also a passive network, and so we gave that port numbers also. So when we say that we want to minimize noise, how do we do that? We have to accomplish a few things. One is that we need to minimize the interaction between these different boxes. And so that means that we need to try to minimize interaction at this port 2 and 3. And we also need to try to minimize the interaction at port 4 and 5. We want to try and maximize the isolation between these boxes. So we want to maximize the isolation between uh, the port 1 and 2 box, the point 3 and 4 box, and also from the point 5 and 6 block. And beyond that, we really want to minimize the noise that's contained inside each one of these boxes. So if we want to look at this, um, the VRM is actually right in the center of the power distribution network, and it's actually the pathway for most noise to get in and out of uh, our system-level devices that we call the loads. I gave these port numbers that hopefully are comfortable to RF and high-speed guys, because I'm sure a lot of you and high-speed guys, but we can look at reverse transfer. That would be what we would see as S12, and that says that if I perturbate the output of the regulator with my high-speed devices, some of the noise is actually going to show up on the input where it will distribute through the system on that power rail at port 1. We have PSR that says that if there is noise on the input voltage, and an example of that would be my starter motor voltage noise created in an automobile, well, some of that is going to come out through port 2, which is the output, and so we would call that S21. We have the SSO noise 
the simultaneous switching noise from the high speed devices, and that interacts with the output impedance, which would be S22 in this case. And we have the interaction between the input filter and the voltage regulator at S11. I did want to highlight the fact that in most switching regulators, S11 is negative, and so URF guys will recognize that that does make the basis of a uh, oscillator. So we need to be very careful about the negative resistance. But what I did want to highlight is that if I look at these different families of graphs, we can see that as the stability of the voltage regulator module is degraded, meaning lower phase margin, we can see that all of the closed loop functions, the reverse transfer and the PSOR and the output impedance are also significantly degraded. So this peak and reverse transfer says that if our loop isn't stable, we'll end up with actually a gain in the transmission between uh, the output and the input. And we'll also end up with a significant degradation in the ability to reject noise at the input from showing up at the output. And we'll also see these impedance peaks that show up on the output side, and that also tends to carry an awful lot of noise. So all of these are related to each other. They're all related to control loop stability. The one that we're going to focus on primarily is impedance. So if all of those are related, why would we choose impedance to focus on? And the answer is really pretty simple. Modern circuits are really dense. I remember back in the 1980s, we flexed our muscles by talking about how many watts per cubic inch we could stuff into a power supply. And in today's world, it's very different. Today we talk about how many power supplies per square inch can we fit into our circuits. The average cell phone today has 35 power supplies. And in those 35 power supplies, they're contained within a very small space of a few tenths of an inch by a few tenths of an inch. I showed a picture of one here. There's not generally much that we can access. The only thing we can ever really see are the decoupling capacitors. And so that does provide one access point that allows us to measure the power supply and PDN performance is by looking at the impedance of these capacitors. As time goes on, speeds go up, bandwidth goes up, and we continue shrinking our devices. So I wanted to show pictures of what some of the new gallium nitride uh, switching power supplies and, and some of the new high-density LDOs look like. Things are continually shrinking, and we, we have less and less access to measure things. And so we chose output impedance as our monitor point because it's one of the very few places that we're relatively certain we can access. So maybe a lot of us are familiar with target impedance. Uh, target impedance says that we can manage distribution noise if we can maintain a certain peak impedance level in our distribution network. Um, that's not really true. We need to be careful about peaks and valleys also. This was the topic of a Keysight how-to video of if you're interested in, in looking at how waves can accumulate. But in this picture, I'm showing three independent resonances that show up at the output capacitor on the left side. On the right side, what I'm showing is that if I can generate a signal that manages to excite all three of those ref resonances, I can do it in a way that makes them phase-related, and ultimately I can stack them all one on top of the other, generating what we would call an accumulation wave or a rogue wave. And a rogue wave simply means that I managed to take all three of those resonances, I managed to get them all to occur simultaneously, and I managed to get them to stack one on top of the other. And if I can do that, we can generate horrific distribution noise. The way that we manage that is we want to try to keep not only a target impedance, but we need to try to keep our impedance flat. And so one of the most important criteria we have in our power distribution network is how flat is it? And so if we look at that same PDN that we looked at in the previous slide, I can create a flat impedance at the same impedance level, and I can generate that same multi-frequency uh, stimulus, and you'll see that now we don't end up with a rogue wave. We end up containing the voltages nicely within the window limits that are allowed. And so it's really essential that we keep flat impedance. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. We talked about flat impedance now, and we talked about planes. 
and we talked about the distribution interfaces, and so they're all made up of elements that are resistive, inductance, and capacitive. And in very simple terms, resistors have flat frequency dependencies, so they're constant amplitude with frequency. Inductances are increasing with increasing frequency, and capacitors have a decreasing impedance with frequency. And so we can relate almost any distribution network by compiling it as functions of R's and L's and C's. RF guys are really smart. They figured out a long time ago that we need to have the source, the interconnect, and the loads match. So we have 50 ohm sources, we have 50 ohm instruments, we have 50 ohm cables, and everything matches very nicely. We end up with a very flat impedance structure. And if we were to draw this pictorial as a schematic, we could look at our voltage regulator module inside this box as a voltage source, and typically it has a series inductance and a series resistance. And in fact, in many of our high-speed simulators, what they ask for is a very simplistic uh, RL equivalent for the VRM. Then we can connect that to a plane, and in this case, uh, we made a one-ohm printed circuit board plane, and then we terminate it into decoupling capacitors, in this case, one microfarad of decoupling capacitance. I made the numbers work out really simply here. So we have one microhenry in the VRM, which arguably is a lot, and we put one microfarad of decoupling capacitance, but that makes the math really easy. The characteristic impedance is one ohm squared L over C. And that also matches the impedance of the plane, which we defined as one ohm. And now we end up with the resistors that set the Q of our loop resonance. And I split that resistance into two pieces. There's one piece that's on the voltage regulator side, and there's one piece that's the ESR of the capacitors. And I can keep that resistance, the total resistance, constant. In our case, we really want... Um, R1 to be equal to R2 and equal to the characteristic impedance because that will give us a flat response. Uh, but I have this M term that allows me to keep the total resistance constant while I vary where it is that exists. I can move it all into the VRM or all into the capacitor, and I can distribute it between the two any way that I like. I can also vary the Q by changing the total value of resistance, and I wanted to show what that looks like when I look at the impedance. And so one of the things that I want to try to make sure that you believe is that if I set everything to match at 1 ohm, you'll see we get a nice flat line at 1 ohm. That is the lowest noise that we can achieve. If I make the voltage regulator module very low in impedance, I'll end up with this blue trace, and you'll see at higher frequencies I end up with a higher impedance. And if I make the voltage regulator module higher in impedance, at higher frequencies we'll see a lower impedance. Those might seem like good things, but I'm going to show you why it is that, that we really need to keep it matched. So if I had a very small parasitic inductance and another local decoupling capacitor, look at these curves again, you'll see in our one ohm uh, matched case, well, we're not perfectly matched at higher frequencies, but we end up with a peak of about one ohm, and then uh, decreasing impedance at higher frequencies. That will ultimately cause issues at higher frequencies, but in the range that we're looking at, it's pretty well behaved. And you'll see if I make a very low impedance VRM, I end up with a peak noise at, at 2 ohms, which is much greater than, than 1. It's 6 dB higher. And if I include the uh, parasitic inductance and capacitance, I can actually resonate that by moving all of the resistance into the VRM and making a low impedance or a low ESR ceramic capacitor, you'll see I end up with the highest noise. And so we have to be very careful about the fact that low impedance VRMs and low ESR ceramic capacitors at the low frequency side can end up creating high frequency noise issues that become very difficult to resolve. So I wanted to demonstrate that in real terms with a simple mm -hmm. network analyzer. And so I connected it to network analyzer, and we're going to say that the network analyzer is connected at the load. So, so our network analyzer is looking from the load side towards the VRM, and the VRM is connected through our uh, characteristic impedance, which I defined in this case as a coaxial cable. And now I can set the impedance of the VRM using an open, short, and load calibrator to be high, low, or matched. 
And in this case, you'll see again, if I match the impedances and with this blue line, nice straight line at 50 ohms. If I make a very low impedance VRM, I'll end up with this green trace. So at low frequencies, it looks really nice. But once I pass the characteristic impedance of the cable, you can say I end up with much higher impedance than I w would have if I had a higher impedance regulator. And if I made the VRM very high impedance, well, I end up with a high impedance at low frequencies, and it gets low at higher frequencies. And if I could extend this to even higher frequencies, we would see transmission line reflections, and the red trace would also be much greater than, than the flat impedance of the blue trace. I can show this with a circuit board also. Whether or not I have a, a transmission line that's comprised of a circuit board or a cable, we end up with the same conditions. So again, the network analyzer is looking at the load side. It's looking through a 50 ohm microstrip. And at the other end, I can have the VRM where I can connect open, load, short terminators in order to see what happens as we change the impedances. And again, you'll see I end up with a nice flat line if I match the impedances. If I use an open VRM or a high impedance VRM, I end up with a high impedance at low frequency, decreasing at the higher frequencies. And if I short it, I end up with an inductive plane that increases with frequency. Ultimately, these will intersect at a frequency beyond our measurement. And then the green trace will be even higher than the blue. And the red will fall down and eventually come up in reflections. I also wanted to point something out, and that is that even though we can't see where it is that those intersect, we can actually determine the exact characteristic impedance of this microstrip by looking at any frequency and dividing the square root of L over C. And we can do that if we look at the uh, square root of the product of the open impedance and the short impedance at any frequency. That is, the square root L over C. And that'll tell us the exact characteristic impedance of our planes. Now, if we had a decoupling capacitor, Again, I wanted to highlight the fact that this low impedance looks very nice, but it is inductive. And so if I go ahead and then connect a decoupling capacitor on the load side, you'll see we'll resonate it, and we will end up with an impedance peak. So our goal really is to try to keep a constant impedance that's about as flat as we can. In this case, you can also see the ESR of the ceramic capacitor we end up with a series resonance at about 21 megahertz or so. And this very low ESR, 10 milliohms, becomes the resistance for our next higher frequency resonance. And so we can end up with a very high Q plane that's related only to the low ESR ceramic capacitor. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. So how does this play in real circuits? I showed you cables, and I showed you applying circuit board. But let's look at what this means in terms of a circuit. So this is the uh, PicoTest VRTS3 training board. And I wanted to show that we have an LDO voltage regulator here. We can choose different capacitors. And then ultimately, we connect through train, play, uh, planes and traces up to a uh, SMD clock. This is a standard SMD clock. We have a decoupling capacitor here. Yeah, we have a, a clock output. Schematically, here's the clock, here's a clock buffer, and we ended up with a decoupling capacitor right between the two. And so now we have an LDO on one side, we have the planes and traces on the other, and we have our decoupling capacitor at the clock. And so what does this mean when we, when we go look at these impedances? I'm going to teach you now how to read the impedance and what the impedance tells us about what we need to do and what it means to our uh, distribution. And so this is a real computer server board. And I'm going to repeat what I said earlier, that flat impedances are resistive, rising impedances are inductors, and falling capacitors, uh, falling impedances are capacitive. And so I measured this computer server motherboard in two states, one with the power off, that's the blue trace, and one with the power on, that's the red trace. And so I have a falling impedance in this very first low-frequency region, and that's obviously a capacitor because it's falling. We end up with a relatively flat portion of the curve here, and that's resistive. Then we end up with a rising part that's obviously inductive. In fact, that's the bulk ESL of our uh, bulk capacitor bank. We end up with another falling curve. That must be a capacitor, so that's the decoupling ceramic capacitors.
we end up with a flat spot at the bottom. That's our minima. So that's the decoupling capacitor ESR. And then we can see an inductive region again because it's increasing. And so that's the ESL of our decoupling capacitors. We can see when we turn the power on, we end up with a nice constant flat impedance. And that tells us that we have uh, a good control loop stability. Once we reach the bandwidth of the control loop, the open loop state and the, control, the closed loop state are the same. And so then we end up with parallel curves. So we can tell by the distance between these two uh, curves, the on state and the off state, whether or not the resonant peaks we see are active or passive. But so this can be really helpful to us. I can go make an impedance measurement. And now what I want to be able to do is ultimately I want to be able to decode what this impedance tells us. And so we decoded this into capacitance, ESR, ESL, decoupling capacitors, and effective series inductance. So let's come back to uh, our VRM case on our printed circuit board. Let's see how these impedance graphs play out. And so I wanted to show you three different curves. We're now looking at the clock output at this connector here. And this is actually the 125 megahertz clock in the top trace. And we're looking at the spectrum of 120 megahertz, 125 megahertz clock in the lower trace. And so we're looking essentially at the noise that's generated by our power distribution network and how it is that gets into the clock. And so I wanted to show three different cases here. We can choose different capacitors at the LDO, so I chose two. I chose a high ESR capacitor, which is in the blue trace. And we can see here is the VRM low impedance regulation, we ultimately hit the capacitor ESR. Then here's the inductance of our planes. We get to the decoupling capacitor that we resonate, and we end up with this peak. You'll see that a low ESR capacitor ends up with a bigger peak than a blue trace. So those low ESR capacitors and keeping the impedance really low at the VRM turned out not to be the best thing in the world for our clock. Uh, but even more importantly, if we look at the characteristic impedance of this plane, it's about 2 and a half ohms. We can calculate that by our resonant frequency and the inductance. And if I insert 2 and a half ohms between the regulator and the clock buffer, essentially degrading the performance of our voltage regulator, making it have very poor regulation, we'll end up with this green trace. Notice that peak is all, all gone. These peaks show up as clock jitter. And in fact, the major source of clock jitter is PDN noise. OK. Um, I want to come back now to our VRM. So how does this apply to our VRM board? Uh, we said that we can decode our impedance measurement into inductors and capacitors and resistors. We did that in the red chart. So we took the bulk capacitance and ESRs and ESLs, and we recreated the uh, waveform of the impedance structure. And that's in this red trace. Also wanted to show that we can improve the flatness by selecting the appropriate values of capacitor and inductance. So in this case, we actually needed more decoupling capacitance, and we needed a high, slightly higher ESR. But if we pick those appropriately, we could end up with an even flatter impedance. And again, impedance is directly related to noise. So if we can get a flatter impedance, we can get lower noise. That's ultimately what it is that we're after. How do we make these measurements? Well, we make these measurements in two states, again, typically with the power off. And so we can see our bulk capacitor. We can see our ESRs. We can see our ESLs. And if we design our control loop right, we'll see our very flat impedance. We measure this essentially using two-port networks. Uh, we need accessories to connect to our voltage regulator modules. Uh, if anybody's interested, we do have power integrity solution bundles at PicoTest that uh, manage these measurements. We're showing the measurement here on a 5061 network analyzer. This is a two-port measurement that's typical of a VRM. All right, so how do we get there? So if flat impedance is really what we're after, and it's really about maintaining flat impedance all the way from the VRM, how do we do that? And so there's a couple of things we need to do. First is we want to select a current mode controller. Current mode controllers allow us to easily set the impedance level where it is that we want it. It's the easiest way for us to do it. There's lots of different types of current mode control, but essentially any current mode controller will work. We need three terms 
uh, in order for us to derive the, the impedance. And unfortunately, most of these terms are not in the data sheets for the, the part, but the three terms we need to know, we need to know where the poles and zeros are in the controller. We know, need to know the power stage transconductance. We need to know where the internal poles and zeros are. And of course, we need to know the output capacitance and ESR, which are critical. There is a relationship, at least at low frequency, that has to do with the closed loop performance of our op amp, which is these two resistors here that set the gain of our control loop, and the power stage transconductance. So our impedance, the flat impedance that we're setting, or out, is simply controlled by those two resistors and our power stage transconductance. And in a current mode converter, it really is as simple as us solving that relationship to get the low impedance correct. So we're going to do this in four pieces. First, we're going to create a noise budget. We need to figure out how much noise we can tolerate on our bus. And so one small piece of this you might know as target impedance. We look at the voltages that we're allowed to put on our rails, the current perturbations that we're allowed to um, exercise our FPGAs with, and we can divide voltage by current and get the target impedance. We need to consider all of the other noise sources as well, and so typically our noise budget is much lower than that, but we pick an impedance level that we're going to design for. Then we're going to set the VRM output resistance to be equal to that impedance level. I will warn you to include component tolerances when you do it, so you will need to set your, your impedance a little bit lower than, than you planned. At every node, we're going to look for inductance terms. We're going to cancel them with capacitors. In every case, we're going to make sure that the capacitor ESR is equal to our desired impedance. I wanted to highlight one relationship, and that is that the value of capacitor that we need in order to dampen inductance is the value of the inductance divided by the impedance level squared. And so one of the things that I wanted to point out is that if you try to set the target impedance too low, the capacitance requirements increase as a second-order function. You'll need um, very large amounts of capacitance if you want to set your impedance very low. So don't set it lower than you need to. But there are some tips. One is that if you minimize the inductance, you'll reduce the capacitor size. There's a couple of ways to do that. One is to increase the bandwidth of the VRM as high as you can. A second way is to locate the regulators close to the lotus that you can. And a third way is to use the widest planes and thinnest printed circuit board dielectrics that you can. Another tip is that there's a lot of variation between voltage regulators, so choose them wisely. In every case, the one that you want is the one with the lowest output inductance. There is a caveat, and that is that no manufacturers um, have a data sheet point that tells us what the effective output inductance of their VRM is. And so we obtain that number by measurement. When we're selecting a VRM, we generally select several, and then we compare them for inductance to figure out which one actually works best for us. Uh, ferrite beads, just a warning. If our goal is to find an inductance and then cancel it with capacitance, Consider the fact that a ferrite bead is highly inductive, and that means that it'll take very large amounts of capacitance to cancel the inductive impact of a bead. And so use them cautiously. I like to say that we should avoid them like the plague, and that doesn't mean that there aren't any applications where they make sense, but it does mean that you've got to be really careful. Uh, finally, linear regulator inductance varies inversely with load current. So if your VRM is a linear regulator, make sure you're assessing this at the lowest operating current. OK, determining the power stage inductance, that's uh, transconductance, sorry, that's generally not in the data sheet. Um, in this particular board that I'm showing here, I did find a reference to it in one of their application notes. And unfortunately, even though they referenced it, it turned out to be incorrect. And that's frequently the case. So you'll want to measure the power stage transconductance. There's two simple ways for us to do that. One is to vary the load current on our uh, circuit and to monitor the compensation voltage or the output of the air amplifier voltage. That's what I did here in this graph. And then we can measure the slope. That slope is the power stage transconductance. 
We can also use the relationship that uh, power stage transconductance is R1 over R2 in our amplifier divided by our flat impedance. So if we can measure the flat impedance and we know the value of the two resistors, we'll know the value of the power stage transconductance. So there's two different ways we can get that. In very simple terms, the reason that it doesn't match what it is that the manufacturer thought it would be is because of DC drops in the plane. In this case, the plane is very, very small. You can see it here. Here's the input return, here's the current sensing resistor, and here's the uh, pulse modulator controller. Uh, that circuit board effect at low frequency was enough to make a 15% difference in power stage transconductance. So there's just kind of a tip is that the printed circuit board can even have significant impacts at DC. So now we need to choose the output capacitor. So we need to choose the output capacitor in order to counteract the inductive nature of the controller. And the inductive nature of the controller is controlled by two things. One, the bandwidth, which is the pole and zero location. And second, the internal compensation, the slope compensation of the controller. Unfortunately, those are generally not specified by the manufacturer. And so here's a tip. What we do is we reduce the value of the capacitor to the point that we can actually see the inductance. We create a, a resonance purposely so that we can see where it is that that inductance is. That inductance will tell us where it is that the poles and zeros exist and what it is that we ultimately need to cancel. In this case, we can see our 3 dB point from our output impedance occurs at 68 kilohertz, 35 milliohms. We want to go ahead and cancel that so we can tell what our capacitance is as uh, 1 over 2 pi times the uh, frequency of the 3 dB point and 35 milliohms, that tells us that we would cancel that inductance with 72 microfarads. And we want all the ESRs to be equal to our, our uh, flat impedance, which in our case here is 25 milliohms. So if we choose a 72 microfarad capacitor that has 25 milliohms, we'll end up with a flat impedance. And you'll see that here in the blue chart. And so that essentially is what we do for each, each inductance that we see in the loop. We go ahead and we cancel them with a uh, capacitor. If we used a low ESR capacitor, like a low ESR ceramic, we would end up with this very low impedance dip. I warned about why it is that that is. And so we increase that by assuring that we use a capacitor as an ESR that matches the flat impedance that's our goal. If we can do that. Uh, we'll end up with a flat impedance. So how do we select those capacitors? That in itself is really a little tricky. We do that by selecting target capacitors, those capacitors that we think will fit the bill. We said we needed 72 microfarads with 25 milliohms, and we can do that by paralleling capacitors. We can choose a single capacitor, but we need to try to find capacitors that fit the bill. We typically find several. We mount them on a two-port circuit board to allow us to make simple measurements. We put SMA ports on them, and we make a two-port shunt-through measurement that we show here. Then we convert that file to a touchstone file, and then we can put that directly into our circuit model, and the circuit model will tell us which capacitors are the best. Mm -hmm. um, some companies do make impedance fixtures, just a warning. Those are typically only good for impedance levels that are below or above 100 milliohms. And so we need to be really careful about that. That's why we mount them on a circuit board. Once we have these into our touchstone format, we can combine them with our simulator and we're off and running. So at this point, I'd like to turn this over to, to Heidi, and Heidi will take us the rest of the way. Thank you, Steve. That was a good uh, introduction to the Power Integrity Basics and looking at the ecosystem of your voltage regulator module with the distributed power distribution network and uh, your sync device, looking at the interactions there. Now I'd like to look at the case study and how uh, simulation and measurement can be used and how we can compare those two. We're going to use the LM20143 uh, buck regulator for the VRM. And what was done here, you can see PicoTest created a nice little uh, demonstration board or characterization board. And this was what was used to, to obtain the transconductance, the poles and zeros, and the output impedance uh, for creating this accurate state-spaced model of the VRM that provides the 
uh, regulated output voltage for our simulation. Also, uh, it is important to remember that you need to measure the capacitors that you want to look at. They are measured with a network analyzer to obtain the S-parameter behavioral model of those capacitors. And then, in this case, we chose four different capacitors to look at with our simulation. And once we'd chosen those capacitors and simulated them with the uh, S-parameter behavioral models, we can then construct those boards with the capacitors installed and look at the measured results, as well as compare this to the original LM20143 evaluation board from Texas Instruments, that, that uh, characterization board that was provided by the manufacturer. So let's look at the results. The results are actually, this is a, a picture of the schematic showing the simulation. On the left is the state-based model of the VRM and the um, slope compensation, internal poles and zeros, and the feedback uh, measured characteristics that we add in there for the state-based model. And then on the output, we have our decoupling capacitors and then a current source simulating our sink. It's the state-based model plus the measured S parameters, behavioral model of the capacitors, that provides incredible fidelity that you'll see in the next slide here, where the measured uh, results in blue are compared to the ADS simulated results in red. By using this measurement-based uh, co-simulation, we get excellent results. On the left, top left, we see the small capacitor, the 15 microfarad. As Steve pointed out, we use a small capacitor to start out with so that we can clearly see the active uh, inductance from the VRM that we need to cancel with our bulk capacitor. The next graph down on the bottom left, is 68 microfarads. We're getting flatter with our impedance, but we have still have a little bit of a bump. If we go over to the 150 microfarads, we can for that impedance, we've got a nice flat uh, PDN characteristic. And then again, at 390 microfarads, we've also have uh, selected a capacitor that cancels that inductance of the VRM and provides for flat impedance. It is important to to realize that. If you actually get an evaluation board from a manufacturer, they do not often uh, select the bulk capacitors for this flat impedance. And you can see here the TI evaluation board had some high frequency decoupling, but had not selected a bulk capacitor to actually flatten out the impedance of that active inductance from the VRM. Next, if you want to take a closer look at the decoupling capacitors and how to add them to obtain low impedance over a broad frequency range for sync applications or, or common high-speed digital applications where switching is happening at a broad range of frequencies and we need flat impedance over a, a wide bandwidth. Here you can see on the left that multiple, that the capacitor is actually made up of, of capacitance, but then at the resonant frequency, it actually starts to become an inductor. It's that LC tank circuit, or the F cap frequency, where that transition happens. At that uh, frequency of the cap, we know, or that resonant frequency, we notice that that is where we have the lowest impedance. By cascading multiple values together, we can provide that low impedance across a broad frequency range. The graph on the right, the effective um, ESL, obviously if we want to go to higher frequencies, we need to keep reducing that series inductance of the capacitor. And the only way to do that is by selecting smaller package sizes and reducing the inductive loop of the mounting on the printed circuit board. And so uh, essentially you're reducing, you're going from large uh, tantalum capacitors down to ceramic capacitors of 0805, 0603, and 0201 to keep reducing that inductance and get out to a higher frequency. Another little trick to remember is that you can actually parallel the capacitors. And it's very interesting to note at the bottom graph here, we can effectively reduce the uh, series resistance, reduce the inductance by a factor of n of of the paralleling of those capacitors, at the same time increasing the amount of capacitance. So that's a valuable trick when you're searching for the right 
uh, capacitor ESR and ESL for your design. Next, we can look at, as, as Steve pointed out, it's very important to get flat impedance. If our capacitor has the right ESR, it will also work over a broader frequency range, minimizing the number of decoupling capacitors that are required and avoiding anti-resonance peaks. There are a limited number of manufacturers out there that provide capacitors with specified ESR. This is an example from TDK. It's a YNA series capacitor with controlled ESR. Another way to get controlled ESR with your capacitor is to actually mount a ceramic capacitor in series with the desired resistance. And here is a picture of a ceramic 47 microfarad capacitor mounted with a 10 milliohm resistor. And you can see the results. It provides a, a flatter uh, impedance and will avoid the anti-resonances when installed with multiple decoupling capacitors. Here is an example of after selecting the bulk capacitor, which is our blue trace on the graph on the right, which is without the smaller decoupling capacitors. We can see the inductance there that we want to counteract or uh, with our capacitance and resonant frequency of the additional decoupling capacitors. By adding the decoupling capacitors, you can see the red trace is extending that flat PDN impedance out to a higher frequency range and covering the requirements of our SYNC uh, high-speed switching digital circuitry. Again, here are the co-simulator results with the decoupling capacitors. The blue trace shows with just the bulk capacitor, and it, it does not extend, um, or was it, it has a limited bandwidth. As you start to add the decoupling capacitors, you can see the blue trace, the 47 microfarad with the 10 milliohm decoupling uh, capacitor, that controlled ESR provides our flat impedance. If we don't have that 10 milliohm resistor installed with a capacitor, we see that we get significant anti-resonances and non-flat impedance. So again, it's important to have capacitors with controlled ESR. Now, it, we've looked very closely at the interaction with the VRM, the, uh, our decoupling capacitors and the sink. It is important to remember that a net list, we were just looking at the schematic in this case, that a simple net list does not tell you everything about the printed circuit board design. A simple net list does not tell you how the signal, uh, signals are routed on the printed circuit board. It does not provide the S-parameter behavioral models of, of the performance of those signal routings. The power distribution network impedance of how the capacitors are mounted, where they're mounted, and the inductances of the, the vias and the configurations there. There's also printed circuit board resonances that can occur depending on the size of your power and ground planes and how perforated they are. There's coupling between power, ground, and even signal, as well as just the, the simple DC IR drop of getting the VRM uh, voltage from the VR, VRM source to the multiple sinks. If you look at the uh, eye diagram on the bottom here, if you only simulate the signal integrity or the path of your signals, you might overestimate the opening or the uh, uh, BER of your design by adding in the added noise of your power integrity, of your power aware models uh, of the actual full design. You can see that there is, uh, again, additional eye closure called uh, caused by the ripple on the power distribution network. Modern day applications are getting quite complex. You can see here an example of an off-the-shelf FPGA from Xilinx. This is the VCU 105 characterization board for the Kintex FPGA. There are 15 major power distribution networks on this characterization board, six major digital interfaces focusing on the DDR4 application in this case, and then six, this is a 16-layer printed circuit board. When doing a power integrity analysis, one of the first places to start is simply with the DC IR drop. And here's an example using ADS PI Pro to do a quick DC simulation and observe how much of uh, the voltage 
from the VRM what IR drop going to the multiple sinks, in this case for DDR chips. This simulation can be used to uh, um, determine if you're within the margin uh, specified by the, the DDR uh, sink chips or whether you need to place sense lines and where might be the optimum location for the sense lines. In addition, you can use EM simulation, our ADS SI Pro tool, to actually simulate the whole printed circuit board topology with power planes, ground planes, and signal nets, to, to, and all of your decoupling capacitors to uh, provide a full EM behavioral model. This model brings out all the ports to those connect nets and connections, and it's very quick to simulate, for instance, with no capacitors, versus with capacitors for optimizing uh, the, for the PDN impedance that you desire. This type of uh, full EM behavioral model of the distributed power uh, and, uh, network along with your signals can be put into a transient simulation. And here on the left, you can see both the signal nets and the uh, voltage regulator and, and power uh, are connected to this full EM model. This is a signal integrity and power integrity co-simulation. And on the right, you can see how uh, power aware models are, provide the, the uh, dynamic load response or the simultaneous switching noise or the effect of when the transistors are switching on the signal or the DQ lines, in the case of DDR, you can see how that noise is fed through that transistor to the power rail for the VCC transient noise, as well as it can feed through the uh, transistor to the VSS ground plane. The simultaneous switching noise is actually captured by the IBIS power aware models and can be used in your transient uh, simulations for uh, looking at the coupling between or the noise feeding in from your power rails into your actual digital logic switching. It is important to lay the groundwork for signal integrity and power integrity co-simulation. It, it's best to start simple, and one of the first places to start is to look at the signal integrity only simulation and look at what the effects are of amplitude ripple and, and jitter uh, that might be caused by your power, uh, your power supply to that device. The, the requirements from the sync uh, from your signal integrity simulations can then be fed back to simple power integrity simulations. Uh, this, the power integrity only number two simulation here is your typical VRM uh, and decoupling capacitor simulations with target impedance and can be done in the ADS transient simulations and also the results from your, your uh, PI uh, Pro AC simulations. The next thing to consider is that you can also just look at the EM behavioral model of simulating the signal traces with the power and ground and simply looking at what crosstalk is maybe happening due to the layout on the printed circuit board and the highly perforated power and ground uh, planes as well as how the signals are being routed. Is there any coupling just on the board, not actually going through the source or the sync chips? And then finally, uh, step four, you can bring it all together into a full simulation using the uh, behavioral model of the power distribution network, the, the print circuit board, including the signal nets, as well as the power and grounds, and running both uh, your transient simulation for your DQ signaling or your sync signaling, as well as the IBIS AMI power aware models for uh, capturing the interactions with the VRM uh, state-based models. So in conclusion, if you're interested in this topic and you'd like more information, Keysight and our solution partner PicoTest would like to encourage you to visit our websites for the latest power integrity measurement and simulation tools. And also, as Steve mentioned earlier, there are some how-to educational videos on YouTube that both Steve and I have done. You can search uh, on YouTube for how 
how to power integrity and also how to fixture and de embedding to find those additional educational resources. If you enjoyed this webcast, please register for the entire series of this Keysight uh, Tutorials in Signal Integrity webcast series. So with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator. Thank you. We will dive right now into the questions. Uh, for starting off, Steve, uh, where did you get the VRM model from? That's a really good question. Um, the VRM model is actually something that I published in my first book called Switch Mode Power Supply, but we are uh, currently migrating that to ADS, and so it will soon be available as a parameterized ADS model. And we do have to make measurements of the device in order to get the parameters. Okay, uh, Heidi, will the ADS simulation examples be available for download? Uh, yes, we'll follow up this webcast series with an email, and we'll provide those web links for people to download the ADS example workspace with the uh, simulations. Okay. Uh, here's one. Why are, are other measured capacitor, capacitor touchstone files available? Uh, I don't see why not. Uh, certainly we can give you the ones that we've measured. Uh, there, there are lots more to measure, so some of them you'll have to measure yourself, but we're certainly happy to share the ones we have. Okay. Great. Steve, here's another question. Uh, if you have several parts that load the VRM, how do you keep the impedance flat at each of the components? That's a really good question. I, mean, I actually get that one pretty uh, routinely. So just like an RF circuit, if we took a 50 ohm source and wanted to connect it to lots of 50 ohm loads, we would need an impedance splitter. And in power distribution, it's not really that different. We need to keep the impedance matched, and so it needs to be distributed through the different loads. And so it doesn't need to be equally split, but at the point that they all come together, they all do need to match the source and the planes that connect from that connection point back to the VRM. Good question. All right, here's another one for you. Uh, why did you use ADS and not SPICE? Oh, that's another really good question. So um, SPICE is actually pretty uh, commonly used for power integrity. The reason that I don't use it is that if ultimately what we care about is the, the load, we really need to be able to do the RF simulation and the high-speed simulation, but we'd really like it connected to the VRM. And so by doing simulation inside ADS, we have access to uh, better simulator engines, but more importantly, it allows us to do end-to-end -end simulation so that we can see the load and the VRM simultaneously. That's really important. Okay. Uh, what broad advice do you have for designers on capacitor selection if you don't have access to advanced simulation, simulation tools or a VNA? Um, the best advice that I can give you would be, um, number one, um, polymer capacitors tend to be much flatter in impedance than standard capacitors. And number two, many of the capacitor manufacturers will measure the uh, characteristics for you. The one thing that I would be careful about is to make sure that you tell them that you want a two-port impedance measurement. A lot of them measure using one port, and that's too low an impedance for capacitor ESR. But another good question. I think most manufacturers will be happy to help. Okay. Well, we have a lot more questions, but we're going to have to respond to those via email. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up today's presentation. And on behalf of Electronic Design, I'd like to thank you very much for joining today's webcast. Also, thank you to Keysight Technologies for sponsoring this event for us today. And have a productive remainder of the day.